Well, greetings yet again, Automation, BeamNG, and NASCAR enjoyers. And yeah, today, I'm going to be making a build based off of the most requested horsepower package by any NASCAR fan. And yeah, in case you're wondering, it's the 1000 horsepower package. Alrighty, so just in case if you have been living under a rock, NASCAR introduced the Gen 7, aka Next Gen chassis in 2022, and one of the things that a lot of NASCAR fans want is more horsepower. They want 1,000 horsepower, yeah. Not just 750 or 800 or 950, 1,000 horsepower. But, is this horsepower configuration actually safe? Well, we're gonna find out. We're gonna pick a body. Select Coupe. Since it is a NASCAR racing car, after all, and I'm going to pick the one that looks like the Mustang. There it is. Yeah, there's a, there's a ton of bodies that you can choose from in automation. And yeah, we're going to choose our materials, steel, yeah, let's do carbon fiber. I might choose steel to make the, the car heavier, just in case. And we're going to go with Front Lodge Toodle, McPherson Strut, since it does have independent, well, actually we'll choose Double Wishbone and Multilink. Well, double wishbone on both ends, since it does have independent suspension. I'm gonna make a new engine, a NASCAR engine. Yeah, six liter. I'm gonna try to tune it up to my heart's content. Yeah, I've made a lot of high horsepower builds in automation before. Especially undrivable hill climb builds that I usually go around in and are usually made for the sole purpose of beating records. Alrighty, so I'm gonna do some research. The engine block is made of cast iron. So I looked it up and it's made of cast iron and it's a push rod V8 since the current NASCAR regs have push rod engines. Yeah. I'm gonna go with a forged steel well, cast iron crank. And just in case if it's if, if it breaks easily, I might go with a different material for the crank itself. And we're gonna go with bounce shafts. Yeah, compression ratio. I'm gonna look that up. Yeah, it's the thing about automation. You have to fine tune your engine with a certain compression ratio. And if you want to base it off a real car, you have to look up the engine's exact compression ratio. Or it's not accurate to the real thing. So yeah, 14 to 1, which is a pretty high compression ratio. Or you go with 14 to 1, 1. Yeah, it's 14 to 1. And, of course, we're also going to look up the RPM. 92 to 9400 RPM, which is a pretty high revving engine. Yeah. 
yeah, this is what you would get with a usual NASCAR spec motor. A 60 degree V8 producing, well, what would usually be 670 horsepower, but in this case, it's going to be a thousand horsepower. Anyhow, yeah, so some people, of course, believe that the vehicles in the parking lot have more power than the Cup Series cars, but they haven't done much research at all, as hardly any SUV, unless if it's like a Bentley Bentago or Jeep Grand Cherokee Trackhawk, barely has like 500 horsepower. Yeah, you get. Yeah, there's a few people with SUVs that produce like 650 to 700 horsepower. You get some sedans that produce well into the 600s, but they're rare and they're pretty expensive. Yes, even Hellcats are expensive. So yeah, it's not likely you're ever going to see anybody with a vehicle that produces more horsepower than what the Cup Series car has. A 670 is still a lot of horsepower. But apparently they want insane figures like 1,000 horsepower. Yeesh. But... I am trying to actually analyze if this build is actually safe to drive or not. Since usually builds in automation with high horsepower values have what is called snap oversteer and there's no way to fix it. Yeah, if you just in case if you haven't known about physics already, snap oversteer usually happens when the car decides to get out of control on its own. So yeah, just improve the engine reliability and yeah, you have to do this stuff, adjust the sliders, yada yada yada. And I'm going to be testing the engine. Yeah, it does sound like a NASCAR engine, and yeah, there's Discord pings in the background. And I'm gonna make sure I give it the aesthetic. Yeah, I'm gonna make it look like a NASCAR engine. This, if, in case you're wondering, is part of my fifth generation Brockle Moonhawk build which is going to be a mix of a Dodge Challenger and Chevy Camaro. So yeah, it is a pretty interesting build. No idea who's picking me. So yeah, I have a bunch of configurations planned, all based on real-life configurations of the Dodge Challenger and Chevrolet Camaro, and some fancy ones as well. I'm gonna make sure that this car looks like a mix between the Camaro and Challenger. Yeah, it's the fifth generation Brooklyn Moonhawk according to the lore description of the vehicle itself. It's gonna be a lot of configs of this car. Yeah, it's more for the body. There, that should be good. longer. There we go. 
Yeah, once we add fixtures and all that, we'll get the car onto the track. So, let's cut to the chase. And here it is. This is the usual super speedway build. Yeah, the 510 horsepower version. And it makes sense of why it's less powerful than the standard configuration as NASCAR has always been using restricted plates ever since the late 80s. And this is an effort to basically make the car safer and to add more strategy into the races. Yeah, some people don't like pack racing, but pack racing is actually strategic. Yeah, it's like NASCAR chess. You have to actually try to think of the best possible line. Yeah, it adds strategy, and it basically is a game of 200 mile per hour chess. And you want to know why NASCAR will never go back to the 210? two tens on super speedways because of a devastating crash that a lot of people think I'm talking about. And even if the cars are safer, they're still pretty dangerous and you've usually seen the wrecks in the super speedway races. They're pretty bad. And yeah, it's a pretty safe speed. It's pretty good for a super speedway build. Although not good enough to a lot of NASCAR fans, apparently. Yeah, I actually like pack racing. I am one of those people that likes pack racing because it's basically like Tour de France on steroids. Yeah, I'm not much of a fan of Tour de France. I never did it as bicycle racing. But just like that. You see people running in the pack trying to hunt down the leader. And it gets really exciting. There might be lead changes up the wazoo. Who knows who might take the lead. Yeah, I think pack racing is actually exciting and produces some close racing. Yeah, more speed and horsepower does not do it. Well-written rule sets doesn't. Yeah, it's not about horsepower, it's about the rule set. And trying to even the playing field, and we're going to go into the pits. Yeah, I ran a few laps, and now I'm going to get out the big bad, the 1,000 horsepower. And yes, even with 1,000 horsepower, it still has a similar top speed to 671 configuration. Yeah, I know it's 670, but I tried to make it close to the real next-gen cars. And here we go. Let's see how safe it really is. Yeah, set so it's a sport mode. Can't actually remove the drive modes, by the way. And, oh man, did you see that? That snap oversteer. That's something that horsepower can't fix. Yeah, if these cars were run in real life, they would be most likely spinning around like Beyblades. Thus proving my point to be valid. If you have more horsepower, it makes the car dangerous. And nearly undrivable. Yeah, you have to be Kyle Larson to be able to tame one of these 1,000 horsepower cars. Yeah. I can see why NASCAR doesn't want to put a 1,000 horsepower in the Cup Series cars. 
And you see that? It's actually eating away fuel pretty quickly. So yeah, these cars are not ideal for safety. In fact, they're kind of the opposite of safe. Yeah, you have like cars that are this fast going around on super speedways. Heck, even Rusty Wallace took the restrictor plate off of his car and ran speeds that are well over 220 miles per hour. He said, could you even imagine pack racing at those speeds? Yeah, it would be scary. Which is why I understand why NASCAR doesn't want to have cars that run in the 220s and the 210s anymore. Because it's dangerous. You have to take into account the driver's safety and how much of a risk it would be to have cars run that fast. And yeah, restrictor plates do make a difference. Yeah, you gotta think about the safety of the cars. But it is pretty fast though, it is faster than the typical NASCAR Super Speedway package. So you are able to go in the two tens with this horsepower package on Super Speedway. So, even though it's deadly and unsafe, is it actually faster? Well, let's find out once we take this car into the pits.
So yeah, in some instances, the 1,000 horsepower fancy package is actually faster than NASCAR's usual packages. And now I'm going to test out the top speed of each and every configuration that I've made, starting with the standard configuration. Yeah, this is the usual 670 package. So let's start it up and see how it roars. Here we go. Let's go. And yeah, it's pretty fast. But not as fast as a lot of people hoped it'd be. And yeah, in some instances, the 1,000 horsepower package is a lot faster than NASCAR's usual packages. Yeah, on the super speedways, it's obvious of which one is faster. Although the difference is barely noticeable on intermediates and on short courses. It's, well, short tracks, it's oddly enough slower than the usual package, unless you mess around with the gear ratios. However, on road courses, it's slightly faster, just a second faster. And on rovals, it's a lot faster due to the fact that the extra horsepower means that it can go faster in long straights. Yeah, I might do a robo setup, and yeah, that's the top speed of the usual package. It's tops out at 225. I've been able to top it out at 228. But anyways, on to the next configuration. And this one is the Super Speedway package. Yeah, NASCAR's usual Super Speedway package. Yeah, and like I said before, this one has a reduced power output compared to NASCAR's other packages. It makes sense. You don't want it to be too fast. So yeah, it's a pretty sensible configuration. It tops out at 195, which is pretty good for the average super speedway car. Because you gotta have safe speeds in order to keep the driver safe and to have pack racing. Top side 195 miles per hour. On to the next package. Yeah, this one. As you can tell, it's going to be the short course package, aka the short track package. And this one has limited gearing to deal with the smaller straights that short tracks usually have. Up next is the short course package, and this one has limited gearing. 
Yeah, the reason why the gearing is limited is because on short courses, you're not going to go 200 miles per hour, so there's no reason to have long gearing at short courses. You only do like 150 or 120 on Bristol. So it actually makes sense of why the gearing is limited with the short course package, or the short track package. And it also has a lower spoiler, as NASCAR wants to make the short track experience more challenging, and hopefully make racing more exciting, but usually short tracks are pretty dead with the next gen car, unless if something exciting happens, like in Richmond. But anyways, on to the road course package. Just like the short track package, it also has limited gearing. And the limited gearing actually makes sense with the road course package as well. On tracks like Sonoma Raceway and Vineyard Raceway, there's not a lot of long straights and you're only ever going to top out at 160. So yeah, you do need the limited gearing, and yeah, top set at 191 miles per hour. And now, uh, on to the most requested horsepower package by any NASCAR fan. 1,000 MFing horsepower. Let's go. Will it top out at 230 miles per hour? Well, let's find out. Here we go. This is it. This is the moment that you've all been waiting for. Here we go. Yeah, even with all that horsepower, still barely, well, still barely manages to top that at 225. So yeah, it's not just horsepower that is a factor here, but downforce in the way of the vehicle and the drivetrain. It's not like the Bugai Chiron where it has driver assist and all wheel drive. This is a rear wheel drive stock car, so. Any amount of added horsepower will make it nearly undrivable. Well, I say nearly undrivable. It could be like Kyle Larson if he still managed to drive that thing. So, yeah. 1,000 horsepower is, well, nothing but a lot of hype to this. Horsepower doesn't usually mean it'll go at 230 miles per hour. 230 miles per hour. It just means that it'll accelerate better. But anyways, on to the fuel economy tests. First up is the usual NASCAR horsepower package. Now, this test is important as fuel mileage does play a Role in NASCAR races. If you run out of fuel, you're basically out of the race. So yeah, you need to save as much fuel as you can, and gas prices are also still pretty high. So it doesn't make much sense to have more horsepower. They also got the cruise control set up since this is a fuel economy test that I'm trying to run the car until it runs out. So yeah, this is a highly important test, as it will prove which 
one of these configurations is the most fuel efficient and the most economical with the gas. Let's go! Yeah, you can set the cruise control as high as you want, which is pretty cool. And this also helps me with fuel economy tests. Go. We're top about 222. Almost there. Yeah, I had to do a jump cut because I didn't want the video to go on for too long. And we're out of fuel. Yeah, it lasted until 17 minutes before it ran out of fuel. So yeah, it's pretty fuel efficient for what it is. And the teams will most likely have to make fuel stops in the race itself. Anyways, on to the super speedway package. Here we go! Gonna set the cruise control to 200. Yeah, this usually burns less fuel than the typical NASCAR package. As it is centered around super speedways and fuel mileage does play a big part in super speedways. You have to make it on as much fuel as you can. So yeah, fuel strategy is actually a huge part of super speedway races and the super speedway package is also one of the more fuel efficient horsepower packages of any kind of NASCAR Site 550 package that didn't work. Anyway, it's on to a jump cut. Almost there. Almost there. Yeah, we're almost out of fuel with this horsepower package. The aerodynamics also helped with saving fuel. So yeah, you need every opportunity you can to save fuel. Oh, and by the way, this is also part of the upcoming 5th generation Ruckle Moonhawk mod. I don't know if I've already said that before, but as I said before, it's going to be based on the Dodge Challenger Chevrolet Camaro, kind of like mixing the two. I'm going to wait until the Al Rima update in order to add a supercharger, as I've heard that the Al Rima update is going to add force deduction. So that's going to be pretty exciting to look forward to. And I'm also going to have other configurations besides race configs like the 6 config and the 4 cylinder config and who knows. I might even do a drag config. Well, it's obvious I'll do a drag pump. But anyways. So far, so good. And yeah, it lasts pretty long, just like the Energizer's bike. Still going. Still going. Oh! There it is. Just ran out of fuel. Yeah, not bad. Easily the most fuel-efficient horsepower package. 
And now, on to the main event. The 1000 horsepower package. I can already tell that this is going to be the least fuel efficient of all the horsepower packages I've tested so far. And in case you're wondering about the vehicular Olympic series, well, it's actually put on hold because of this experiment. Yeah, I've made this video to basically prove the advantages and disadvantages of having 1,000 horsepower in a next-gen Cup Series car. And yeah, it accelerates pretty fast. That's one advantage that it has, acceleration. Yeah, it's true that it's faster, but there are also other disadvantages, like snap oversteer. And in case you're wondering, no, more horsepower isn't going to fix the problem of the snap oversteer. In fact, it'll make it worse. Yeah, the car will be faster but will be nearly undrivable due to how much horsepower it will have. And you also have to factor in downforce and the weight of the vehicle itself, which the drivetrain has. There's a lot of variables and mathematics to consider here. Yeah, would you look at that? I'm already down to 89%, and it's barely been a minute. That's how much fuel it actually burns. I'm actually going to show you the full fuel run this tire around since it ate away its gas tank like Big smoke eats away his meals. Yeah, I had to really go there. This horsepower configuration drinks fuel like big smoke drinks a large soda. Yeah, you remember that character, Big Smoke from Grand Theft Auto San Andreas? Yeah, beginning to see another downside of the 1,000 horsepower package, another disadvantage. The fuel mileage, it's not very good. Yeah, you're not going to save any fuel with this package. Could you even imagine how many gas cans the pit crews would have to bring with if these cars actually had 1,000 horsepower in real life? It would be astronomically expensive, and keep in mind, gas is already expensive as it is, but if you have more horsepower, you're going to eat away at your fuel tank within 12 minutes or less. Unless you have some sort of hybridization or hybrid component. Yeah, I'll try to see if it's better with a hybrid configuration, but you have to do some coding and stuff like that in order to do a hybrid car automation. Unless if automation somehow puts in hybridization. itself with the export parts. Yeah, it's eating away at its fuel tank. Not ideal for any track that requires a fuel mileage strategy. Yeah, America's a problem. Americans probably like going around in gas guzzlers as they like to spend a lot of money on gas. I have no idea why several people still have the urge to buy really big.
big SUVs aside from safety and having a 6% likelihood of going into a head-on collision. It doesn't make sense for this day and age as gas prices are expensive and really big SUVs like the Chevy Suburban and Ford Expedition do not make sense in this economy. You will be spending a lot of money on gas with them. And in an economy where gas prices matter, that's a deal breaker. Kind of like this configuration, which, believe it or not, is down 50% already. This is astonishing. And despite having a thousand horsepower, it still manages to top out at 225 miles per hour. And that's something you also have to keep in mind with these cars. Yes, even the 670 configuration that I made. topped out at 228, and that only had 671 horsepower. So it just goes to show that horsepower doesn't really matter when it comes to top speed. Like I said, it could be the weight of the vehicle, drivetrain, and aerodynamics. And how much drag the car has. You'll have to do some math in order to Math is usually key to figuring out the top speed of the car and safety. And of course, the amount of G loads in the 1000 horsepower package also means that it is hard to control and, like I said, suffers from snap over steel. Yeah, no, it's just a game. But BMG has physics that match closely to what we have in real life. And if it happens to BMG, it'll happen in real life as well. So take into account what will happen if NASCAR racing cars actually had a thousand horsepower. And this video is there to prove a point about this highly requested horsepower package. And yes, it's also cost prohibitive to a lot of teams and shows. If BMG had tire thermal Imagine how much the tires wear out for horsepower. I couldn't even imagine. It'll be just as much as how much fuel it'll be burning. And every team would have to have a gazillion tires with it. It'll be a cost nightmare. And the goal of the next gen cars is to be as cheap to maintain as possible, not having charters like that. So having a thousand horsepower and all of these tires and gas cans would be pretty expensive. So yeah. While 1,000 horsepower might work in a fantasy world, it probably won't work that well in real life. And you have to do some math in order to find out why it wouldn't work that well. 
math is usually key. And NASCAR also wants to allow a fourth OEM to join the sport. So it also plays into why NASCAR will not increase the horsepower of their cars. It's not only dangerous and expensive, but it also means that a fourth OEM will not join the sport. Yeah, a lot of fans want about the horsepower. I understand that will make the cars faster, but there's also disadvantages to having a fast horsepower. We're almost out of fuel, by the way. I've made the same exact configuration that a lot of people want. 1,000 horsepower with a 4 inch spoiler. Yeah, just messing around with my ear pods and trying to check the battery status on the ear pods themselves. That's what that sound is, just in case you're wondering. Mathematics is usually important to anything. And when you do mathematics, you basically calculate and visualize what actually goes on in certain things. Math is pretty cool. And would you look at that, out of fuel. We're basically running on fumes here. So yeah, that proves my point. So are the 1,000 horsepower NASCAR racing cars fast? Yes. If the NASCAR racing cars that had 1,000 horsepower, they would be wicked fast. Are they safe? No. They suffer from snap oversteer and are pretty much nearly undrivable. Unless if you're Kyle Larson. So yeah, there's advantages and disadvantages to having a thousand horsepower. The cars will be faster, people will get to see records that they've never seen in years, like Bill Elliott's record being beat if they don't have the restrictor plates, and they even get to see records in the 2010s get beat. But there's also disadvantages though. The fuel eats away pretty quickly, and this isn't the 2010s anymore. We're not in the 2010s era of NASCAR anymore. We're in the modern era of NASCAR, and gas prices are pretty high. Back then, it made sense to have 950 horsepower. Gas wasn't as expensive, but now it's pretty expensive, and it doesn't make sense anymore. And you also have the fact that there's a lot of oversteer, excessive oversteer, and like I said, snap oversteer comes into play here. Yeah, if you try to control the car, it'll just spin out on its own. You don't need to be a good driver to do that. And some people will ask, well, if the cars are too fast, then why not hire better drivers and replace those drivers? <clears throat> Drivers are not disposable. Drivers are, aren't like people in a usual workplace that you can just fire on the spot if they do too poorly. These are drivers that get paid pretty well and get paid like a lot of money. And firing them wouldn't make much sense just because of the cars being way too fast. Yeah, no, race cars are supposed to be fast. But not this fast, though. Not so fast it'll be dangerous. I mean, remember the Kart World Series? Remember why these cars crash out a lot? And remember why there are driver injuries and fatalities? Yeah, it's because of how fast the cars were. Yeah. 
they're really fast, and a lot of people like them. I mean, I do. But they're also pretty dangerous to drive. And yeah, if you like this video, well, you know what to do. Like, comment, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out on the latest Racer Cinema Productions video. And there's also another BeamNG video that you might like. Yeah, it's a video of another car in automation that I've made that I might revise sometime in the future. Make a newer version of it or a remaster to be more precise. However, to people who are already subscribed to my channel, all you have to do is like and comment. So yeah, this is the Bandito signing off, and I think I did a pretty good job of proving why 1,000 horsepower in a next-gen car wouldn't work that well in real life. What'd you think of it? Let me know in the comments. But for now, this is the Bandito signing off. Catch you guys next time, and peace out.